big question today. And as, as Daniel said, this is a big topic, like performance, performance reviews that matter. Um, and the key question is this. So just imagine this for a second. What would change? You know, I love these what would change questions. What would change if the people in your organization were having effective performance conversations with their managers, with each other, and with the other people uh, who report up through them. Okay, so what would, what would change if the people in your organization or around you, it doesn't matter how big or how small, were having effective performance conversations, like this was working for us, what would change? Um, and, and what would change specifically related to these, these conversations occurring? And I bet some of you are thinking to yourself, so yeah, that'd be awesome. But you're also thinking to yourself, that feels like a mountain to climb. There's this reality. And I, I think this is true if we're honest in all kinds of organizations. If some of you say like, we do this really well, I'm good for you. Like that is amazing. But I think most of us feel like we could do this better. And the challenge with thinking about performance conversations and reviews is first of all, it feels very, um, I just saw that commercial where it's, it's some robot and he's trying to check the box that says, I am not a robot. And it's, you know, I don't know why that conversation kind of struck my funny, funny bone. But in some ways, I think we treat performance reviews in this whole process as we think about it as a very, in very robotic kinds of ways. So let me just deal with some of the industrial organizational side of things uh, for just a moment, that psychological side, because I feel there's I feel a bit of responsibility in this conversation. Um, this is content that I have uh, attempted to teach for years, but it's pretty complex. And, uh, and so one thing I want to mention to you is that the background in the, the guild that both Daniel and I are trained in, performance management is one of the fundamental building blocks upon which the entire field is built. I would say the other building block that is fundamental is selection. So I, you've heard me say this before, maybe that these, this is the bread and butter of industrial organizational psychology is performance management and selection. I, and I say this, I always describe our guild as really powerful especially in corporate context, because you're talking about what gets a person in the door, like how that, what that gate looks like. Um, not only the gate to get through, but how, how a person is that fit is selected, but also what is rewarded and how the conversations take place around what is rewarded and what, what performance looks like. And the reason why that's been so important, and this feels like a pretty heavy topic to even begin to address, which I'll give myself permission to sort of bottom shelf this in just a moment, but is that the reason why that's, that's so critical is, um, is in many ways because big corporations are concerned about their selection processes. And how do we, for example, one of the big, big areas in this is bias. And why is there bias you know, in selection processes or performance processes? Because we are human, all right? So, because like the reality is we kind of have to face this reality that we are, we are like approaching wholeness, but we're also broken. So we screw this up. So we have to we have to build, but we have to have processes, especially in large corporations. So the reason why that's all key is for IO psychologists. IO psychologists are, are experts at, um, at data processes and, and validity. And so big corporations are very, very concerned that their performance processes and their selection process are valid. Like, can you, can you back them up? Do they, do they connect to the actual job? I mean, Amy, Bar I'm looking at Amy right now because I taught this content like in 1994 when I really didn't understand it that well, trying to help undergrads understand like what is performance management when they're just like going like, I'm in the dorm trying to figure out how to deal with my RA. So, um, so it's just, it's something that has, it's so critical, but we're talking about conversations, but to talk about performance conversations, I wanna set up performance in general for just a second, okay? Um, and here's a couple of things to think about uh, that this is the reality I know so many of you face is that contracting behind performance information and management has to start early. Okay, so there are things that happen long before we're ever sitting at that table with a with an employee that hopefully started early and for many of you are going to start now or sometime in the near future. And so when I say contracting, I was thinking about even with wild leaders, some of the things that are a part of our corporate context that are really important for that conversation. So a couple of things I'll mention, like one thing, we have a cultural charter. 
We have a charter that every new employee reads and, and agrees to before they ever come around. So it's like, so there's, and what our charter is, is a cultural expectation. So it's not specific to the job, but it's like, what is it like to be here? You know, what, what can you expect from wild leaders and what, what can, what, what do we expect from you? And by the way, like, we all have to live into that because my, one of the things on my list is that we have leaders at the top who are actually living into what that is, that statement is. So when I say early, this cultural charter for us plays a role in performance. And so I think that's when I say contracting early is so people know what they're getting themselves into. Uh, number two, selection of people who are ready. <laughs> to jump in like selection plays a role in this right we can't deny that what are we do we have i want i want to i'll say more about that in just a second um we also have this this, this hopefully we've got when i say contracting early a culture that's built through the work of mature people who are also immature like i don't know what to do with that right it's like human beings who hopefully are seeking to be better versions of themselves um, and then another thing I want to mention is like the, this contracting early, it's clear job descriptions. Like you can't escape that, like as clear as possible and making sure that the job descriptions like fit with what the job is. Like this is actually what we hope people will be doing well. And it's fascinating because I know this seems like a lot of work, especially those of you in, in small to mid cap, mid cap companies, because you're like, we don't have job descriptions. And I'm like, well, maybe you should start because it's a little bit of work to just a very simple structure describing a job is kind of key for that. So there's, but there's some, so those are some, when I say contracting, early, like this starts way before we're ever sitting at that table, hopefully. And I know this too, if some of you are thinking, we don't have good, we don't have those things, Rob. And you're thinking, I want to start those things. I would say this, in an existing organization, when you put a performance management system in place, or you build a cultural charter, expect people to look at you like this and go like oh now we're going to start managing performance like you got to expect people because you have you don't have that system and people then feel like oh so now we're going to put this in place you know it's like one point when i was in college my dad i came home from from school my dad goes son you need a budget and i'm like oh now we need a budget you know so it was like so um so it expects some of that resistance before you start to, you know, maybe it takes a couple of years to get that embedded in your culture. So what are the big questions? Here's some big questions around this, and then we'll get into some uh, getting right into how to have the conversation. First big question, what is performance? And I will tell you that the experts go round and round about this over the years. One of the challenges has been it's difficult to measure performance. It's really challenging to do that. And from that, from that standpoint, it's difficult to actually study performance. One of the biggest challenges from uh, apply industrial organizational psychologists trying to study this is in order to study it well, you actually have to have access to performance data within, inside or in, within organizations. And so the people who actually have the job to study it may not be on the inside, they may not be able to get the data. At one point in time for about a decade, you know what the best measure of performance we had psychologically speaking was? It was called organizational citizenship behaviors. So people were defining performance as whether or not people are going above and beyond, like picking up the trash that's laying on the floor when they walk by. You know, it's like things like that were interesting because we couldn't find really good measures. I'm going to tell you something. Now that I am, I, I mean, some of you know, I was a professor, uh, you know, for 25 years. And so it wasn't until I got outside of my guild that I started to kind of open my brain up a little bit because I kind of felt responsible to the literature and all the criterion talk around performance. But one of the, the, the I'm just telling you, one of the, the descriptions of performance I like best is this, putting on a great show. I just think that's a really interesting way to think about performance. Like what if our job was to put on a great show for every person that walks in our door or shows up in our Zoom. And it, it, I just think it's interesting. I, I don't know if it's, if it's solid or not, but I like it. So I'm just, for now, I'm buying into that. The next big question is this, that we've been asked often, is should development conversations happen in the same place as performance review conversations? Should development conversations occur in the same, literally the same space as development, uh, as performance, performance and development, should they occur together? And I, always, I this is my this is my response at this point, given my experience and some of the research out there. Absolutely yes, if everyone's performing well. All right, that would be in our ideal world. Everyone's performing well, so 
let's just say that Claire's having a conversation with Rob about his performance. And if everything's going well, it's like, hey, Rob, you're killing it. It's awesome. Like you are, you're doing your fitness. Let's walk through the criteria. It's all there. And uh, that's cool. Now let's talk about what do you want to learn next? You know, what, do, what would you like to, what are, what's on your development plan? It's very different than Claire having a conversation with me saying like, Okay, Rob, this is the fifth time we've had this conversation about you not meeting your performance goals, your quotas, you're not meeting, if it's in sales, you know, we're not getting there. You're not only that, you're disruptive to the team, but Rob, what would you like to learn? You see that? So it's like, it's just, it's, it's, it's clunky when the, so the reality is in most of our organizations, we have some people are performing and some people aren't. And so I would, that's why I say that in most cases, I think we need to separate them. I think it's just helpful because it's easier to have a conversation. Now I would say this that if we started the development investment sooner, these performance conversations would go better later. If people were seeing their developmental challenges as developmental challenges earlier in the process, and this is what we've seen with organizations we work with, if that infrastructure and process in place, it goes better later. And then the last thing is this big question, why do we struggle with this? Why is this so hard? Um, I think one thing is we don't put systems in place and lay the groundwork well, and we don't follow through that well sometimes. The other thing is that we are human beings and performance management conversations are hard. And if you think they're not hard, you have a different problem. Do you hear what I'm saying? So the, the manager who thinks, oh, no, these are, I do this well, let's talk about something else. I'm like, no, we've got another thing to talk about there that you may have lacked that connective tissue into the reality that's hard for somebody. So it's like, so the, the reality is that we struggle to do these well. And I think admitting that is part of it. So let me get into the, con I'm gonna, so I'm gonna give you some tips on, and we go wherever it is you is most meaningful and helpful to you and your own organization. But uh, I'm gonna give you some, I wanna give you four, cause this was about performance conversations and reviews. So let me give you four tips that have some good research behind them. All right. Um, there, is, there is a bottom line is this, like great performance and development conversations both are built on, kind of a process of trusting and mature relationships. Like if you, that's why that, I think that contracting is key. So, um, and here, here's what's also interesting about actual conversations is that there's some interesting research on what's described as a, as a self-fulfilling prophecy in this area. So it's actually when, when uh, in, in multiple studies, when if, if, a, uh, if a leader or a teacher, by the way, is told that there are certain people who are the high performers and others who aren't, and they don't know that people are randomly assigned, they will treat people differently based on the assumption of what they've been told about these different people. One thing we know that, that's, that is clear is that it is key to set high expectations, express confidence, and give people the autonomy to excel. Set high expectations. That's the tough part. Setting the bar high. Expressing confidence. So affirmation matters. And different people might receive it differently. We got to be thoughtful about that. Some people aren't, it's not the words, you know, it's going to be different ways they receive it, but people need to feel a sense that you feel confident. And if you don't, they're going to know, right? And then finally is also autonomy to excel. So what does it mean to actually, so based on that, let me tell you, here's what I would suggest, just as a starting point for having better conversations. The first thing is this, let's, let me just say that I'm sitting down, I'm going to pick on Amy. Let's just say that Amy and I are sitting down for a conversation, Okay. Um, the number one thing, state your intentions of being clear and honest. These are tough conversations. They're easy if people are all performing well, but I think we should, we should do so, so standardize this process where you always do this, whether they're performing well or not. And so one example is an instant, an, my intention is to be clear and honest with you and to hopefully, you know, help you improve the way you're performing. Now, now doing that is what, and you gotta, you gotta lean into this. Like people are going to be like, what is he going to say? <laughs> you know, but, but the reality is stating your intentions is important because you've, you've also established some contracting. It also is good for us to do that. Number two, identify the problem as a behavior. Okay. Not making it personal, but as a behavior and avoid hyperbole. Statements like you are always disrupting the team. Okay, specificity around, so behavior and specificity to moments is helpful. Let me, and so, so identifying the problem as a behavior and not making it personal. Um, for example, 
uh, Amy, this is funny. <laughs> I'm just picking on Amy. Uh, in staff meetings, you're the first person to point, you've been the first person to point out problems with other people's ideas. Okay, that's something that I've seen you do in the last three staff meetings. You, you tend to be the first person who points out the problems with other people's ideas. The third thing is this, now, which I'm going to continue to address this, is identify how the problem is important to the company's business, to the organization's business. And here's an example of that. So our job as a team is to create innovative solutions. So when other people feel muted, we can't get there. So when the first thing we do is our, our job as a team is we got to have a lot of ideas on the table. And so Amy, when you, when you bring that first thing is to point out the problem in someone's innovation, we can't get there. And we have to do that as a team because our marketing will not go if we don't do this. And then the last thing is to end with what my uh, dear friends, uh, Paul Yost and Mary Mann and Plunkett would describe as end with a partnering statement. Um, and I love this because here's, here's one of the ways that I've done this before is you have a very influential voice on this team, Amy. Like you have a powerful voice. And, um, and my concern is that if this continues, others will no longer listen to you. Um, and we need your voice in this. So can you help me understand? So how does that all feel to you? So and at this point, here's the other thing that we use as a key metric is now once I've laid out that foundation, now Amy should talk more than I do. One of my key metrics is that maybe it's 60 to 70% of the conversation is now Amy's reflection on what I've said, maybe, re, maybe uh, repeating that, what I just said at the very end of this conversation, if it's necessary. Now, I, I all want, if we go to this conversation, you all know that I'm, I, uh, I don't consider myself a, an expert in performance management. These are just some things that when I draw on the literature that's out there that have been, have been suggestions for how to do this well. And I hope for some of you, I think we all could improve in this. I felt convicted even preparing for this, I'll tell you, in multiple ways this week with the people that I work with. So let's get into conversations for where you need to go, want to go.